Hello, thanks for joining us for this webinar on medical cannabis for chronic pain. I'm Jason Jordan and I'm a director of MCRA and a patient advocate. I have multiple sclerosis so I know pain and my personal experience has been that cannabinoid medicine has not only treated many of my symptoms, it's also allowed me to get off the vast majority of the daily medications I was on. Like so many, when I was first told about cannabis as a treatment, I was skeptical. But now through years of being involved in this charity and seeing firsthand how people not only benefit but thrive, I'm eager to help everyone have the opportunity to see if it works just as well for them. Now, whilst cannabis is still illegal to use without a prescription everywhere apart from the ACT, things are progressing. It's getting easier to get a script and prices are coming down. It's still too expensive and not on the PBS, but market forces will continue to drive the price down. At MCRA, we're continuing to advocate on behalf of all Australian patients for this medicine to be subsidised as a safer, healthier, non-addictive alternative to the likes of opiates and other toxic drugs. Tonight, we've gathered medical professionals and patients to give you the basics on what medical cannabis is, how it works, a little bit of history, how to get hold of it, and most importantly of all, we're going to hear from people who are legally prescribed and find out more about their journey. Please keep in mind as you enjoy the webinar that everyone involved is a volunteer and isn't being paid. We do not receive any government funding, so our ability to educate, advocate and commission research relies entirely on your donations and sponsorship from the industry. That said, we maintain complete independence and we make it very clear to all sponsors that we will not be swayed from giving the best education and information that we possibly can. This is all about you and me, the patients who may benefit from medical cannabis. Thanks again for your attendance and your support. Medical Cannabis Research Australia would like to thank Little Green Pharma and MedLab for sponsoring this webinar. Previously, we had to charge a small fee to fund putting these sorts of events together, but thanks to the generosity of our sponsors, we can invite you free of charge. And that helps us get this important message out to a much wider audience. All right, let's take a look at our panel for this evening. First up, Dr. Gull Hertzberg. Now, he's a GP based on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. He's been prescribing medical cannabis since 2017. Gull is a keen collaborator who, in addition to his clinical work, is working to help the right people get the right treatment in the right place at the right time. He has a passion for digital health, is a founding director of the Australian and New Zealand College of Cannabinoid Practitioners, and he's our first presenter for this evening. Dr. Frank Buchanan is a Melbourne-based anaesthetist and interventional pain medicine physician. Frank is actively involved in anaesthetic and pain research, having published in numerous peer-reviewed anaesthetic and pain journals. He's a member of numerous associations, including the Australian Society of Anaesthetists, the Australian Pain Society, the International Association for the Study of Pain, and the International Neuromodulation Society. He has also been previously a research fellow at the anaesthetic department of the Mercy Hospital for Women and at the Alfred Hospital. Charlene Maver is a founder and director of Medical Cannabis Research Australia. Charlene is a medical scientist and has a particular interest in research around cannabinoid medications. Charlene has attended dozens of international conferences, as well as having presented in virtually every capital city in Australia, as well as in the UK. Her knowledge and passion for this medicine is obvious. Stephen is a medical cannabis patient who suffers from migraines. Now that's a small word to describe a horrible disabling condition that can affect vision, hearing, balance, smell, taste and mental acuity. Migraines can make people unemployable and can even lead to suicide. Stephen is now being treated with medical cannabis and wants to share his story of hope and recovery. Barb Fullerton is the National Education Manager for Little Green Pharma, a seed-to-sale medical cannabis company based in Western Australia. Barb has over 11 years experience in the pharmaceutical industry in both marketing and sales management roles, with two global leaders and across a number of different disease states. Before starting work at Little Green Pharma in 2017, she spent three years widening her breadth of knowledge and experience working in technology startups. Barb has a Bachelor of Science degree and also has an MBA, a marketing major, from Curtin Graduate School of Business. Oh, and of course we do have one more guest. It's our very special bonus guest this evening. It's Paul Maver. He's a registered pharmacist in both Australia and the United Kingdom. Now his company, Health House, was granted the first medicinal cannabis import license in Australia. 
and is currently distributing medicinal cannabis products to eligible patients. Over the last 30 years, he's owned several retail pharmacies and worked both in Australia and the United Kingdom. In the last three years, he's focused on researching medicinal cannabis and has been an invited speaker and attendee at many of the world's leading medical cannabis conferences. He's got deep relationships in the medical and patient advocacy sectors, and he is our final guest for this evening. But stick around because he's got a lot to say and he's normally quite entertaining. Paul will also be here for our Q&A panel at the end of this particular webinar. Right, on with the show. Dr. Gull Hertzberg is from the Bellingen Healing Centre and specialises in cannabinoids. He's going to tell us all about the system that we have built into our body that actually allows the cannabis to work. Good evening. I'm Dr. Gull Hertzberg. I'm going to give a brief presentation in two parts about medical cannabis. The first part, we'll discuss whether or not cannabis can help with pain brief review of the evidence and the second part will be how does cannabis affect humans with some discussion around the endocannabinoid system phytocannabinoids and the interaction of the two so part one does cannabis help with pain is there any evidence i'm going to give a bit of context to the evidence remembering that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So briefly, I had a quick look on PubMed, the public, published medical literature, some of you may know it. And in 2020, using the term cancer, there were 234,000 published articles. Alcohol in 2020, 33,000 published articles. Opioid, 10,000 published articles in 2020 and cannabis 3000 so that's just the numbers what type of evidence is there remembering not all published articles are actually evidence so the best evidence there is that we can get is a systematic review of all relevant randomized control trials after that it's a meta-analysis of all randomized control trials and down we go in terms of levels of evidence Level seven in terms of filtered evidence is one properly designed randomized control trial. So very important to note that randomization helps a lot, gives a higher level of evidence than those when the subject, subject selection is not random. And similarly, controlled studies, in other words, where there's a control group and a study group that gets active treatment those type of studies provide a higher level of evidence than those that don't have that. Hence, randomized controlled trials. There isn't no absence of evidence. There's a lot of evidence for the use of cannabis in pain. In fact, searching PubMed up until just the other day, in fact, there were 79 systematic reviews, 30 meta-analyses, meta-analyses, excuse me, 54 randomized controlled clinical trials, and overall, 1,851 publications looking at the term, search terms, cannabis and pain. So if we look particularly at the 79 systematic reviews to see what sort of evidence there is. Well, the studies that were looked at utilized a range of modes of administration of cannabis, Oral administration as oils and capsules, inhaled, and topical cannabis. And what sort of cannabis did they use? Well, mostly, they just looked at cannabis. Some studies looked at THC in different concentrations. Some studies looked at CBD, also in different concentrations. And some studies looked at different ratios of THC to CBD. And if, as I looked, looking increasingly more recently, there were some studies looking at particular products, or chemovars, strains, and different entourages. In other words, mo the molecules in different cannabis products. So somewhat less just cannabis as a single entity, and more specifically, 
particular molecules or particular chemovars or products. So what does the evidence show? Well, the main outcome that was reported in the systematic reviews said most systematic reviews found that the evidence is of low quality and as usual in medical science and probably many, many areas of science, more studies of better quality need to be done. But overall, without presenting you now with detailed findings, I'll just pull together this particular 2017. So it's already old and there's still some newest, newest reviews since then. But this was a very, very large review from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine in the United States. And there is conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for the treatment of chronic pain in adults. Really important to understand, as many of you probably already know, that when you've tried one cannabis product, you've tried one cannabis product. There is huge variability in plant, product, and person in terms of the molecules in the plant and the effect they have on the person. So now with that in mind, I'm going to talk about the endocannabinoid system, phytocannabinoids and their interaction. In other words, how does cannabis do what cannabis does? So just briefly, the endocannabinoid system is a system of molecules, enzymes and receptors that we have in our bodies that the molecules of which and the receptors of which um, are activated by and similar to phytocannabinoids. In other words, phyto being plant, cannabinoid molecules that come from plants. So somehow the plant material that we get into our body interacts with our body because we have aspects of our being that are ready to receive and respond to these molecules whether it's luck, grand design, or evolution, that's beyond the scope of this talk. So there are 144 known cannabinoids so far. Here's a brief set of pictures of 17 of them. The most famous ones, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, cannabidiol, are um, pictured here on the left. These are 17 of the 144. So plenty more. There are also terpenes, which are essentially the molecules that give plants their smell and their taste to a large extent. And some of you who are well-versed in cannabis um, may know some or many of these names. beta caryophylline is one lovely sounding word. Um, geraniol, linalool, limonene, terpinolene, Many of these molecules are found in many, many plants. In fact, there are 200 known terpenes in cannabis. There are over 20,000 known terpenes described in the plant world. So I used the term chemovar before. Essentially, chemovar is the chemical composition of a plant at harvest. In other words, referring to the molecules in this plant, especially cannabinoids and terpenes, but excuse me, um, perhaps other molecules as well, which contribute to its biological effects on the user. Now they may or may not contribute, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about. Each, on, each molecule on its own or in combination with other molecules, other cannabinoids, other terpenes, may have an effect. And in fact, sometimes two different molecules working together will have a different effect than a single or an other molecule on its own. So you may have heard the term, the entourage effect. Entourage is how we describe the set of molecules in a particular plant or product from cannabis that are working together, let's say, uh, to create a particular effect. So one could think in these terms, the entourage effect, is made up of cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, all working together to create this effect. The endocannabinoid system within our body 
we have the molecules that look like cannabinoids that are found in plants to some extent. They certainly bind to and activate receptors, CB1 and CB2 receptors, that cause effects in cells. And the two most studied and well-known endocannabinoids are anandamide, otherwise known as AEA, and 2-AG. As well as the endocannabinoids themselves, the endocannabinoid system is also made up of receptors. CB1 and CB2 are the most well-known, but there are other receptors as well, increasingly being found and their activity being studied. And then there are enzymes of the endocannabinoid system which may be triggered to produce endocannabinoids, to degrade endocannabinoids, to cause receptors to be made um, or possibly degraded. So it's a combination of the molecules themselves, the receptors and the enzymes that in total makes up the endocannabinoid system. So receptors, in the endocannabinoid system are found in the brain and throughout the central nervous system, in other words, the spinal cord, in immune system cells, which are in the bloodstream and in the marrow, in the spleen. There are trip V1 receptors, hmm, interesting spelling mistake, that are found also in the liver, kidney, stomach, um, trip V2 receptors, GR, GPR. 18s, a range of molecule of receptors throughout the body, each of which respond differently to different cannabinoids. So cannabis and phytocannabinoids, which are the molecules that come from the outside, they can bind to and they do bind to receptors in the body. Now these different receptor types are bound to by various different cannabinoid molecules. Um, CB1 is the target molecule for THC. That's very well known. Um, to some extent, also CB2. Um, as you look at more, as we look at more and more of the cannabis cannabinoid molecules, uh, we find that it, the different receptors are bound to and activated variably by different molecules. So if that sounds a bit vague, it's because it is. And increasingly, more and more research is being done into cannabinoids, their target, inverted commas, because we probably don't think they're actually designed to bind to these receptors, but they do bind to these receptors, and then they activate those receptors. But interestingly, not all cannabinoid activity works through receptors. CBD, for example, in point three on this slide, discusses that, um, has been identified to act on more than 65 different molecular targets, not necessarily receptors. Um, so um, a cannabinoid can bind to a receptor and activate it. For example, what THC does or AEA does to CB1 receptors. CBD can bind to and activate a serotonin receptor known as a 5-HT1A receptor. Um, it may, and one of the important clinical activities of CBD is that it can bind to, but not activate a CB1 receptor such that when THC binds to that same receptor, the activity of that receptor, or the activity of THC on that receptor is modulated, is reduced. And that is very important in terms of reducing the psychoactive effect of THC. In the presence of CBD. So you can get more non psychoactive effects from THC than you could if you were just using it without CBD. So you may be able to tolerate higher doses to get better effect. Clearly, every cell type that is affected by a cannabinoid, terpene, entourage, is going to have a different effect. A nerve cell is going to respond differently to a cell in the gut, to a blood cell. But essentially, what it could do by changing its activity generally in a cell may make more or less molecules occur. So in nerve cells, more or less neurotransmission, which may result in less pain, 
potentially more pain. That doesn't seem to be the case usually. It may change appetite or wake or sleep. Then another activity that could occur as molecules are bound to and affect cells is intercellular signaling. So certain cells, cells talk to each other all the time through hormones, cytokines. And so as cannabinoids and terpenes bind to different cells, they may change the way those cells signal other cells. And it's very likely this is the sort of process that occurs where cannabis can affect inflammation or have some effect on immune function across the whole body. Something we might call immunomodulation. So we have an endocannabinoid system and each of us, the tone of our system based on the molecules we have, the receptors we have, the enzymes, how well they're activated or non-activated can be, that's variable between us. When we get molecules of cannabis into our body, we get a different set of molecules. So the entourage that we get, and then our gut microbiome, our psychology, liver pathways, all sorts of things can affect the way that our body, our individual cells, our tissues, our systems, and our whole being responds to the cannabinoids and terpenes that get into our body. So how do we decide which cannabis is useful for which, this, which condition or which situation? So as a cannabis clinician, that's a constant question for me. What's the best one for you? And there are I won't go into that now, but just to let you know that the research, published research gives some information and certainly confidence to use cannabis generally and to try to work out which products, which entourages may be most helpful for a particular person in a particular situation. But it's really important that we get involved in research as much as we can as clinicians, as patients, as industry, government, and Let's help research into cannabis so that we can be more accurate with our prescribing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gull. Dr. Frank Buchanan now from Elgin Pain Management. Take it away, Frank. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank Charlene and Medicinal Cannabis Australia for inviting me to speak about medicinal cannabis and its use in chronic pain. Because um, I've got 10 minutes, it's quite a big topic for such a short period of time. So I'm going to try my best not to bore anyone and hopefully not to go too much over. Um, so basically, a um, bit of my bio, I'm just a specialist anesthetist, interventional pain physician Director of Elgin Pain Management here in Melbourne, Victoria. I'm primarily a clinician scientist, also involved in undergraduate, postgraduate teaching in anesthesia and pain management um, at the university level and also the college level. Most importantly, I'm a father, AFL tragic and quite an average soccer coach. So hopefully this lecture isn't too average for everyone to listen to. Um, disclaimers, I've received no financial endorsements from any medicinal cannabis company. Um, the medicinal cannabis is primarily or currently not endorsed by the Australian New Zealand College of Anesis, of which I'm a fellow, and especially the pain faculty of Vanska. The views presented today are primarily my own and based on my years of clinical experience and, and also from my patients, what I've learned from prescribing medicinal cannabis for them. Uh, I suppose when we talk about anything about chronic pain, need to define what it is. Pain, I suppose, is an unpleasant sensation. Um, also associated with emotional experiences, which can occur in conjunction with actual potential tissue damage. And this is a new definition was put forward by the International Association for the Study of Pain, of which I'm a member, Primary World Pain Association. From that, chronic pain is defined as, you know, pain that's basically been around for three months. Okay. Our treatment goals for chronic pain for any any pain physician is really to restore function, to decrease pain wherever possible, but not necessarily to try and cure. And that's what I always, you know, enforce the patients who might not necessarily be able to rid them of their pain, but at least to decrease it as, as much as is possible, to also correct the secondary consequences of pain. And that's really important, such so as just depression, 
um, poor sleep, inability to you know function in terms of activities of daily living, to work, etc. The catchphrase of modern pain management is multimodal pain management. So that means we use physiotherapists, occupational therapists, pain psychologists, exercise physiologists, social workers, etc., all geared towards trying to achieve the best possible outcomes for the chronic pain patient. This is basically to show it's a complex phenomenon. There's a lot of stuff that happens at the cellular level, which where, where the primary triggers are, pains then transmitted through your spinal cord up to your brain, which is the primary endpoint for all pain perception. So you can see, um, since I graduated 26 years ago, understanding the pain has changed greatly. We didn't really know much at all about cannabis then, and um, the whole field of endocannabinoid system in chronic pain is quite exciting. Another pathway, not just trying to bore people to death, but just to show you there's a lot of chemicals involved in pain of which, you know, um, the, the cannabinoids are also involved in and share a lot of interesting pathways in this pain pathway. Why do we use medicinal cannabis and pain? Well, um, I suppose as a pain physician, currently we will have to say, you know, there's limited evidence in terms of the benefit of pain. That's on, on what we call level one evidence, which is a classic gold standard that we use for, for treatment, then there, there really isn't much. However, there, that's not to say there isn't a lot of evidence, anecdotal evidence and, and smaller studies are showing it has an effect, but not to the you know high standard that we usually like to use. However, the main point, take home point here, I always say to my students, patients, everyone, the absence of evidence in itself does not mean absence of effect. Just because we haven't proven it doesn't mean it doesn't work. One of the primary, I suppose, motivators for you know increased use of medicinal cannabis is really the groundswell of enthusiasm, both here in Australia and overseas, which is um, really a reflection, I think, of the poor outcomes in, in you know traditional medicine in trying to help people with pain and other conditions where we think medicinal cannabis might be useful. Also, another factor is improve regulatory access. The fact that the TGA has um, regulated and allowed us to prescribe it has also improved um, the use or allowed the increased use of medicinal cannabis. There's also better understanding of the effects involved. And as I always say to patients, why not? If the drug is predominantly safe, it's not making things worse. And if patients are quite keen, then why not give it a go and see, you never know, you might be surprised. In terms of definition, we say, Medicinal cannabis, you know, people think about smoking weed, but basically refer to medicinal cannabis as any cannabis or cannabis product which is prescribed to relieve a medical condition. The three main forms are obviously the unregulated and like, you know, the, the, the illicit stuff that you, people get, then local um, um, dealers in cannabis or on the internet. There's the controlled and standardized herbal cannabis, which you can get, which you inhale, like, you know, and then there's obviously the pharmaceutical extracts from the cannabis plant sativa, which is then medically prescribed, but we're not going to spend too much about that. Basically, my criteria is if the patient's keen, they've tried a lot of other things, then that's usually um, one of my criteria for using it. As long as it doesn't make things worse, there's no contraindications. When I say age, I mean too young, less than 18, history of psychosis or psychotic illness, cardiac disease. Here, this is more a relative contraindication as long as your tick is not too bad, you know, because of some of the effects of the cannabis, then I'm happy. And as long as the patient's not pregnant, once again, I say, as long as it's not the first choice treatment, I don't think we're at that stage where it's the primary treatment choice for chronic pain. Patient has to agree to sign the contact the consent, aware of the get out clause. We tried for at least 12 weeks. Where are the costs? Unfortunately, one of the biggest drawbacks of cannabis is it's quite expensive. Um, so, so I'm always making sure people are aware of the costs and also aware of their legal obligations, depending on which state you are. Currently in the state of Victoria, if you have THC in your system, even if medically prescribed, then, you know, that's against the law. So patients are aware of that. And I also don't like them to take any illicit drugs. Now, there's a few types, all containing the different compounds, which have previously been said in another lecture, CBD, THC. Of this, probably the most evidence is really with the combined THC CBD product. And that's what I'll probably talk about, you know, um, with my case studies anyway. Um, 
and I think that's going to be the most effective from a pain relieving point of view. Um, limited evidence with the CBD in terms of chronic pain, however, it's usually quite preferred by a lot of patients as a starting medication because especially if driving is an issue. THC may show some of benefits from nerve type of pain, you know, the sharp burning pain that people get. Um, uh, but, you know, side effects are always a big issue with it. Um, everyone who gets prescribed cannabis in my practice, they all undertake a survey. It gives us, um, it's also, you know, it's confidential, but it gives us really important clinical and research data. It's not a drug that's been done through, you know, like we're learning as we're prescribing, and so is the TGA to a certain degree. Half of all my patients that have been prescribed, I've got over 100, um, so are still using at greater than 12 weeks, which I think is quite good. Um, the main reason is that there might not be such big improvements on the pain on our data, but they feel better, and you can't you can't quantitate this. They feel so much better, Doc, on taking it. Their anxiety is so much better. Their sleep so much better. But most importantly, their activities of daily living. Their family think that they're doing much more, and that's the most important thing. I've got two cases, just trying to demonstrate the you know um, effects of cannabis. First one common scenario that I see. Women in their late 60s, long history of fibromyalgia. So this is a generalized pain disorder. They're, they're quite sore muscular-wise throughout the body. You know, usually says her poor sleep, poor mood, poor activities of daily living. She has quite a few things. So the main reason she came and saw me was escalating opioid use. GP referred her to see what we can do. Usually my go-to in this situation is give everyone a go ketamine. It's a great drug. Unfortunately, you're going to give it either intravenously, subcutaneously, um, so you need a needle, they've got to come in for a few days. Pain usually improves whilst on it. Some patients it can be short-lived once the infusion stops. Others do really well for a few months, but unfortunately she was the one that didn't do so well in terms once we stopped the infusion. So I said, why don't we come try CBD, give that a go. She was quite keen. Usual adage is start low, go slow. Um, interestingly, so we used the CBD only because she was quite keen to drive. Um, first few weeks is, you know, the low dose when we followed her up, you know, pain really didn't improve much. Now she said she was sleeping better and less anxious. After a few weeks, we got her up to about two mils uh, morning and night of the 50 milligrams, changed it to a higher concentration. So, you know, less volume. So it lasts longer. Um, now she's still continuing at, I think, six months time, pain's decreased. Um, you know, about one to two points on the, on the pain scale out of 10, which is, which isn't so great. It's, you know, a mild to moderate effect, but she's feeling great. She's sleeping better. She's more anxious, less, less anxious. And most importantly, she's weaning off all the opioids, which I think are quite crap um, from a long-term point of view. But that's another talk another day. Um, patient B is, is another patient. Commonly see, I specialize in female chronic pelvic pain. Young woman, once again, tried a lot of painkillers, tried Lyrica, Endip, tried nerve blocks. All these things, you know, yeah, they reduce the pain a little bit, just but the, you know, um, but still not ideal. In the end, we put a spinal cord stimulator into her back um, and her pelvis improved her pain, her pelvic pain improved dramatically. However, I find, you know, when someone's been in pain for a long time, they usually, you know, have increased sensitivity to pain in general and other parts of the body, and this is what predominated, probably developed, you know, like a fibromyalgia syndrome. But the most important thing, she was keen to wean off her early opioids and get rid of that brain fog that she was in because of all the drugs. Um, once again, we, we tried ketamine, only short-lived. So I commenced on the CBD only because, you know, with her driving was an important thing at the start. We started low, gradually increased to about 1 to 1 point half. Sorry about that. 1 to 1 and a half mils twice a day. Um, uh, and, and that had just a mild analgesic effect. However, anxiety was a lot better. So then combined, you know, changed the oil to combined THC CBD oil, which we use twice a day. Much better pain response. More importantly, she was sleeping better, but still not adequate. So then I changed it to a higher THC CBD, where we were roughly two to to one of THC to CBD, which I think is quite a good combination for, for chronic pain. She had a really good pain response. We not for opioids and we were able to get her off the Lyrica. So, you know, from a brain fog point of view, her cognitive state, you know, her mental awareness, everything was so much better. So in summary, my take home message, 
I think cannabis and medicinal cannabis has an important role to play in chronic pain management. Maybe not so much now, but I think certainly watch this space. I think in the future, you know, we're going to be, it's, we're going to be talking more about it as our understanding of the physiology of the endocannabinoid system in chronic pain improves. The role and extent of its use in chronic pain still remains to be determined. I think it's the combined, you know, the combined THC CBD oil is the most useful for nerve pain that, you know, hasn't responded to any other treatments. Um, I think there's a role for it. Most important thing, I think it's its main use now is to help reduce opioids, but also help people feel better. And, you know, hey, that's one of our most important goals as a pain physician. I think the field is ever evolving. Watch this space. And most importantly, always seek advice from your doctor. Tell them, you know, I think if you're thinking about it, then always raise it. And you never know, you might be surprised. And you might be, um, you know, you might have a, a medico that's also quite keen on it as well. Okay, thank you. And thanks for all your patience. Hopefully I didn't get too many people asleep. Thanks very much, Frank. It's time now for our very own Charlene Maver, medical scientist from MCRA. Hi, everybody. My name is Charlene Maver. I'm a medical scientist and also managing director of Medical Cannabis Research Australia. I'm going to speak to you very briefly for five minutes about clinical trials around chronic pain using medicinal cannabis. So I'm just going to start off with um, the first trial is being run by a commercial uh, drug company called MedLab Clinical, and they're going to be targeting chronic pain in an observational trial. So they'll, they'll be using a THC CBD buccal spray, which uses a nanotechnology to enhance drug delivery and efficacy. So this will be run in all states and territories and any prescribing doctor of this product can enlist the patient in this trial. The medicine will be subsidized by the company, which is great news, and participants will be followed monthly for a maximum of 12 months. It's currently recruiting, and they are looking for 2,000 patients with plans to finish by 2024. The next study is being run by the Lambert Initiative of Cannabinoid Therapeutics based at Sydney Uni, and this will be run at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Sydney. So this is chronic pain after spinal cord injury and will be a randomised double blood placebo control study, which is a gold standard study that eliminates all bias, which is our best type of study we can do. So they'll be looking at cannabidiol to, um, and its ability to reduce pain. Uh, the reason why I, um, I did talk about it being a randomised control trial is that these um, gold standard trials are trials that are needed for all product companies to get listed on the Australian Therapeutic Goods Register. So um, basically a particular product is uh, tested for efficacy uh, for a certain condition and all bias must be eliminated in the trial for the highest scientific evidence. So once a product is listed on this ARTG, the Australian Therapeutic Goods Register, then it can be considered for the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, which of course is of great benefit to all of us because it's going to be a lot cheaper. So the next trial I'll talk about is cannabinoids and post acute post-operative pain in uh, participants having stomal reversal. So this is a non-commercial trial run out of John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle, New South Wales, and they are looking at three different products, which is a cannabis flower a THC oil and a THC CBD buccal spray. And this is ongoing um, at the moment and they're looking for 18 participants. So quite a small pilot study, but they're actually looking to test if medicinal cannabis not so much is an effective pain management, but rather if it's safely administered and tolerated by patients in hospital having this type of surgery. So they'll also be able to measure the cannabinoid content of um, the blood of these patients, which is really great data to collect. Now, um, the next couple of trials I'm going to mention are actually observational studies um, by commercial companies. So it's basically an opportunity to collect a lot of data 
um, with patients who were currently uh, packing different medicinal cannabis products. And most of them are looking at all conditions, including chronic pain. So the first one is a um, product uh, clinic company with, uh, with associated products and Swinburne University of Technology. And they are um, not yet recruiting, but they do have ethics, so it should be going ahead very soon. So all the states and territories will be involved and they're hoping to recruit 2,000 patients until 2023, completing in 2025. So the next study is being also run by a commercial group um, product company called Bob Australia, and they are looking at testing um, their CBD rich uh, medicinal cannabis for all, um, all treatment conditions, including chronic pain, and they'll be using six specific clinics and all, in all states and territories, but they're actually offering two free bottles of medicine and the remainder of the medicine will also be subsidised for the rest of the 12 months that these patients are followed. And, um, and they're looking at 500 patients recruiting this year and completing next year. Um, the last study I'll briefly mention is being run by Applied Cannabis Research, which is a research um, company who is um, running this trial for several different companies and their products. And that, that will be run in all states and territories. And they're looking at 20,000 patients to recruit until 2023 and um, completing in 2024. And once again, looking at all conditions, which will include chronic pain as well. Thanks so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do want to um, contact me, please contact me on my email and also on social media as I'm active in all of those. Enjoy the rest of the Thank you, Charlene. Stephen uses cannabis to treat migraines. We have another patient to have a chat to, so please welcome Steve Ning. Uh, he has got a personal experience to describe to you regarding medicinal cannabis and migraines. So, Steve, welcome. Um, Tell us Hello. about your history with migraines, your pain levels, and how you've managed your pain previously to medicinal cannabis. So I, uh, I, I started getting migraines when I was about 16. Um, uh, all of a sudden, uh, I mean, I got tests done, um, I saw a doctor, uh, they didn't sort of know what was going on. I personally suspect it was due to uh, high caffeine intake. And uh, when I was younger, um, they didn't give me anything for my first experience of having a migraine. So I see like the aura um, and I get real, really bad pains in my head. Basically have to sleep it off essentially um, and you lose one to two days. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I, I ended up experiencing this a number of times over the years, um, generally about half a dozen times a year, like really badly. Um, started taking it more seriously and the doctors ended up, ended up prescribing me uh, Maxalt, um, and yeah, I uh, found that it didn't really help that much for like actual pain. Uh, it just made me feel really, really tired and out of it. Um, and uh, even at, at one time, I, I felt like I lost control of my limbs. I had to be sort of like carried out of my office um, and guided to, to uh, an Uber to, to get home. And it yeah, just really, really bad side effect like that. Um, so I told the doctor about that. Then. I was prescribed um, immigrant or somatriptane and uh, I think similar as Maxalt side effects, very similar, just really, really tired out of it, weak. The next day was a write off, just groggy as anything. And um, then prescribed NDEP, um, which I didn't use very often because uh, I didn't like the side effects of that either. Um, uh, just made me again, really dizzy. Um, and, you know, more side effects like being constipated the next day. Uh, so, yeah, not really uh, ideal. Yeah, and, and we, we're hearing that for um, these, you know, medications that are in current use for pain that there is just so many side effects. And mm. uh, constipation is a really big one. Not fun. No. So, I guess, um, how did you come to know about medicinal cannabis that it could be an option for your pain? Um, someone introduced me to it. Um, they suggested it to me, which um, uh, I, 
I like to think it, I was a bit silly because so I admin a cannabis community group. And um, yeah, I, I thought, okay, well, I'll go see a doctor. I saw a doctor at Hemp Expo and uh, yeah, just to see if it was in approved condition. And uh, I, it was. Um, and I thought, okay, why not? Let's just apply. Let's just go for it. Let's try it. What's the worst that can happen? Yep. Awesome. I was probably one of the uh, expos that I was working at too. Yeah, probably, yeah. 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 <laughs> it was often a two or three clinics there. So, yeah, um, yeah a great source of information, that's for sure. So, um, so you found a doctor to agree. Um, was that difficult? And, and getting the prescription approved, did that take a while? Uh, good question. Um, it, it was quite a straightforward process. Um, like, I've gone through a few different clinics now. Um, They've all been really easy to deal with. Uh, my own GP is quite supportive of what I do in my life. Uh, she was reluctant to sort of like put in the application herself to the TGA, unfamiliar with the process. And uh, I think she, she was happy to write referral and the health summary. And my first prescription took, I think like four days by the TGA to get approved. And that was like about 18 months, two years ago. Uh, I just recently had another one put through through for so a different type of flower and it took like two days, 48 hours. Um, process is easy as. Um, cost wise, very reasonable in comparison to say going to like a specialist or urologist or something like that. I uh, thought, you know, worth the cost. Um, very easy process. Yeah, definitely. And especially if you can come off a, a lot of other medications. Mm. So mm. What, are you, what are you currently using now and how is it helping your pain, Steve? So I use a CBD oil during the day. Uh, I, I was advised to titrate up, um, like to start low and go slow with that, uh, just to see what the benefits would be. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. I, I find it helps like with general well-being, and it probably just keeps anxiousness at bay and stress lower and helps keep those migraines away. Uh, when I do have a migraine, uh, I have a high THC flour that I vape uh, and a high THC oil that um, I have to take a couple of drops off and that I have no side effects from that. I bounce back the next day, like pretty much straight away. Uh, I don't think there's like, you know, in comparison to the other meds that I was on, uh, it puts me in a better state of mind. Um, yeah. And it's just, yeah, just overall more positive. Um, I can deal with the situation a lot better uh, from a mental um, sort of like point of view. Uh, I'm not anxious. Um, I know I'm going to bounce back the next day and be right as rain. And Definitely. you know, I, yeah, I 100% I believe in it and recommend it. Yeah, that's fantastic news. And do you think you've noticed some other beneficial effects? Like, ha has your sleep been better, or, or you found some other? Positive yeah, effects? definitely. Um, you know, occasionally I take the high THC oil, like if I, I, I'm in a stressful situation, I want to get a better night's rest. Um, definitely helps with sleep. Uh, during the migraine as well, like the combination of the THC oil and the, the, the flower works brilliantly. Um, you know, I have a more restful sort of recovery period. Um, and just overall well, well-being, I think, is uh, th there's nothing but positives. I don't feel any negative at all like no constipation no extra anxiety um uh no sort of i guess you could say like grogginess or drowsiness as such i, I feel actually oddly enough despite um uh i guess you know uh, stereotypical sort of like comments and things like you know it's not i don't feel groggy <laughs> i feel pretty good <laughs> That's fantastic, Steve. I'm so glad that you've had really positive results. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We're going to have to leave it there. Yeah, no worries. Um, but we will be inviting you back a little bit later for the Q&A. So I'm sure there'll be loads of questions uh, for you from our attendees. Thanks very yeah. much, Steve. Thank you very much, Charlene, and happy to share my experience. The whole process of seed to sale is fascinating. Here's Barb Fullerton to tell us a bit more. Hi there, my name is Barb Fullerton and I'm the um, National Education uh, Manager at, here at Little Green Pharma and also head up the sales and distribution side. Um, 
here in Australia and wanted to talk to you about the Australian cannabis industry from seed to sale or to patient. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard of Little Green Pharma, we're Australia's first grower and producer of medicinal cannabis here in Australia, and we're based in WA. So I will get started. So I guess it's important to understand how many patients are actually accessing medicinal cannabis. And there's data that gets published every month by the TGA. Um, and this is for, through a specific pathway called the Special Access Scheme B pathway. Um, and as of the end of January, there were, and, and as of today, really, because I've added a few based on February, there's been around 93,000 patients or, or applications made and approved for medicinal cannabis. And there's an important distinction. So if you look at the trend versus when it first started in 2018 to 2019, which showed um, in that time a six-fold increase to 2019 to last year, where there was a two-fold increase, you can see there's really some exponential growth. Um, and you can see in the last four months, things are still growing. Um, there's about a 7% month-on-month growth rate for um, new patients um, or new applications being made for medicinal cannabis, but it, it is starting to slow a little bit. So does this mean that 93,000 patients are taking medicinal cannabis? The numbers are a little bit misleading. So based on some, some published numbers um, by, uh, that were done to the Senate inquiry, um, we were able to calculate or get a rough estimate on how many patients are actually accessing medicinal cannabis. So it's, the number is not actually 93,000 patients. It's more like around 60,000 patients that have accessed medicinal cannabis and probably around 30,000 are taking it today. So just to give you an idea of the size of the market and how many people are taking it. But the good thing is more and more people are taking it um, or being able to access it every day as more doctors get educated. Um, so what is medicinal cannabis being used to treat? And again, these um, numbers were indicative um, at the end of 2019, but the percentages are still the same. So even though those numbers have grown exponentially. So a large proportion of patients are accessing it for, med for chronic pain. Um, and that consists of a lot of areas, um, which includes neuropathic pain, other things like fibromyalgia and migraines. A smaller proportion, but still significant, are accessing it for um, cancer-related symptoms. So that's about 11%. and then Goes down from there in terms of psychological conditions. So, so anxiety, um, post-traumatic stress disorder are commonly treated with medicinal cannabis. Um, and then um, epilepsy seizures, the movement disorders, and sleep after that. So um, there's 130 conditions um, that have been approved for the use of medicinal cannabis through the special access scheme. So it's also important to touch upon illicit access to medical cannabis, or what we call the green market. Um, and this is Ian McGregor, who heads up the Lambert Initiative um, in Sydney. And he estimated um, in 2018 that there were around 100,000 Australians using illicit cannabis for medical purposes. And I would estimate that that number is actually much greater today because of there's so much airplay around this area. Um, and so one thing I wanted to just chat about in terms of um, understanding medical versus the illicit or the green market is they're not really the same thing. And I just want you to understand why. So if you look at some studies that have been done in overseas markets where cannabis is accessible, um, so you, you look at the US market where cannabis is illegal, um, in a study that was actually looking at the products that were being sold in that market, um, and they looked at the label accuracy, so what they said on the label, is that actually what's in the product? The answer is no, out of the majority of the cases, and this is in the legal market. So only 17% of products in this study were accurately labeled. If you look at um, products that were purchased online, 31% um, were accurately labeled. So these are really low numbers in a legal market um, and one that's regulated. Looking at the UK CBD market, this, this is a little bit worrisome, particularly for there's a lot of patients trying to access it illegally, I know here in Australia and bringing it in from overseas. So what you need to be aware of is that um, in the UK study that tested the legal CBD products, only 38% were labeled accurately. So the majority are not labeled accurately. Um, almost that same number, that same percentage, almost 40% had less than 50% of what they said was on the label. So what you think you're paying for and what you're getting are, are two different things. But what's scary is particularly patients that might be working in mines or, or um, jobs with zero tolerance, 50 or 45%, almost 50% of those um, products being sold had measurable levels of THC. So that's a real danger um, that you're putting yourself in if you think that you're purchasing just a CBD product. They're not going through the same testing or regulations as you would if you were getting um, a product prescribed by a doctor. 
Um, the other thing to be aware of is pesticides, the presence of pesticides and heavy metals. Cannabis is highly, highly absorbent. It's used in Chernobyl to remove radiation from the soil, and pesticides can stay in a, in a cannabis plant um, after it's gone to seed after three generations. So again, something to be aware of in terms of patients that may be immunocompromised or something like that. Um, quickly, this is a study that was called the Pelican Study. Um, it was published in 2018, looking at parents in Australia sourcing illicit CBD for their children with uncontrolled epilepsy. Of the 51 samples tested, um, 38 out of 51 were rated as effective. 24 of those samples had no CBD at all. So these patients were giving their children products with zero t CBD. Um, and 13 out of the non-effective were had no CBD. Almost all of them had THC. So parents wanting to avoid giving their, their children with epilepsy THC, almost all of them had THC. And only two out of the 51 um, products were, were, had, were CBD only. And there was an inaccurately labeled um, percentage of 98%. So that's the danger, um, particularly parents with young kids that, are, that you would take if you're, if you're looking at accessing it illicitly. So just buyer beware. Um, in terms of the Australian cultivation process, I can take you through our manufacturing and cultivation process. So I'll show you where we're growing. It's right here in that circle. I can't actually tell you because we're regulated by the um, ODC. So that's um, a secret that we that's held tightly. Um, but in the grow facility, we, we grow all indoor. Um, so we use what we use mother plants or cloning technology. So we get a consistency in product in the chemo virus minor cannabinoids. Um, in that controlled environment, we, we control everything from the lighting, the humidity, temperature, the water, the nutrient cycle. Um, and we do that so we get a more consistent product in the end, which is better for patients. Um, the average growth cycle can vary depending on the cultivar. Um, so it's between 10 and 14 weeks. Um, the harvest for us, the first time we harvested, uh, uh, once we did our expansion, um, the plants in that grow, it took two days, um, 10 people. I think we were being very careful, but that's a, that's a picture of what that process looks like. So it's all done in a, um, a very controlled environment. The drying of the plants takes about two weeks. And in that, we're really testing for the humidity and the moisture content. So this is a, um, the product being tested for moisture here. Once it's dried, we get it sent off for our first test. That's TGO-93, and that's testing for um, heavy metals, bacteria, pesticides, all the things that you don't want but could be found in, in the illicit product. Once we get that test back, um, we're then able to extract the resin. So there's two common ways to extract, um, CO2 extraction and ethanol. Um, once that product is um, extracted, that's when we send it off for the second test. In that test, we're looking at the THC and CBD content. So then we can blend with a high TH strain with a high CBD strain to get the different ratios of product we bring to market. And this is what the resin looks like. It's like a thick honey colored um, resin is the end product. The manufacturing is, so we're taking the trichomes from that, from that flower. We're then extracting that resin. We simply add MCT oil, um, which is quite a stable oil and then put it in the bottle. We then send it off for its third test or the final product testing. And in that, we're, we're um, looking at the THC and the CBD content. And we want it to be plus or minus 10% of what's on the label. If we've confirmed that with testing, we're able to then send that product off um, to our distrib distrib distribution network. And um, we send off a TGA declaration to the TGA saying that that product's fit for sale. So that's a summary of the manufacturing process. So, so how do you access it as a patient? So glad you asked. So there's a lot of patient resources on littlegreenpharma.com. There's actually an MI eligible quiz, and this will tell you whether you're likely to be able to access medicinal cannabis. Um, if you are eligible, you've then got a few different options. You can discuss it with your doctor. Um, and again, we have a patient resource which... Um, helps you have that discussion with your doctor. You can also reach out to companies like Little Green Pharma and we can get in touch with your doctor and give them the information they need to help them make an informed decision and also help them with the process of applying for medicinal cannabis. There's also clinical trials. So encourage patients um, of you interested in being part of a trial to look up the Quest Initiative. As part of that, that's a study that's being run by the University of Sydney that has um, subsidized medication for up to 12 months. 
Um, as part of that, they're collecting quality of life data. Um, it's the world's largest quality of life study being run out of University of Sydney's quality of life office. Um, so that's a great way to, to access it. And in that, you can get your own doctor to enroll you into Quest, or, or you can um, go with a Quest approved doctor. The third way is through find a doctor um, on Green Choices. So that's greenchoices.com.au. And you can find um, a doctor that's comfortable discussing medicinal cannabis with you as a treatment option. So those are the three things you can do as a patient if you, if you are deemed eligible or think you might be eligible. Um, if there's any doctors or pharmacists, there's a resource, the LGP Medical Portal, which um, also has some great resources, including education um, and application support and videos you can watch. Um, happy to have any questions. If you want to contact me, here's my, uh, my name, our phone number, and um, best email. Um, and always happy to, to assist in any way we can. Thanks and look forward to chatting with you on the panel. Brent has had some fantastic results from medical cannabis. Here's Charlene to interview Brent. Everybody, I've got here with me today uh, Brent Grundy, who's going to have a chat to me about his spinal injury and how medicinal cannabis has helped him. So welcome, Brent. Thank you for having me. Um, Brent, tell us about your injury and what medication you had tried before medicinal cannabis. I've got um, two bulge discs in the lower back, L5-S1. So in the past, I've tried um, Lyrica, Tarjan, Endone, and Patadine Fort. I was on, um, I think, that Endone and the Patadine Fort for like 16 months until I got onto the oils. Yeah, so that quite a quite a lot of medication there. And what kind of side effects were you experiencing, and were they working for you, Brent? To start off with, yes, but then the body got immune to them, and then at the end, yeah, they just weren't doing what they were supposed to do. Um, and with a lot of other medication, constipation was a main thing as well. So, yeah, it just wasn't the best. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, since I've, since I've been on the oil, it's a lot better. So how did you come across medicinal cannabis? What made you decide to try it and or try to get access through your doctor? Um, a friend of mine at home, he um, is on a Facebook site. So he had a chat to me about it and then I had a chat to my GP. And yeah, he was happy for me to give it a go. Like you don't know till you try. And yeah, since I've been on, it's been great. That's fantastic. So you started off with CBD. How did you go with that? And, and how long have you been on that, Brent? I've been on the CBD for maybe four or five months. Um, I started off that first, um, just in the mornings and at night. And I was taking 12 tablets a day for all the pain and I'm down to two tablets now but the tablets I'm on now isn't for pain that's other stuff so yeah I'm off all the pain medication just on the oils great so CBD was working pretty well but you found you wanted to you needed more pain relief you it wasn't really fully addressing it is that no with the CBD, it was okay during the day. It would like still had a little bit of pain there, but not as much as I had. So it controls the pain during the day. And then for at night time, it was worse like trying to sleep. So then I got onto the THC and yeah, I've been sleeping a lot better. Right. And, and how long have you been on THC now? Um, probably maybe two or three months. And yeah, both of them together, they're great. Yeah. So did you have um, much trouble talking to your doctor about it? He, was he on board and did he know much about medicinal cannabis? No, he didn't know much about it either. So both of us were in the same spot. So yeah, it was just um, word of mouth and research. And yeah, he was quite happy for me to go down that track. Oh, and fantastic. I've seen him since I've been on both of the oils. And yeah, he's happy as well. 
he's got other patients talking about the oils to him with um, their chronic pain. Oh, that's great. So you've mm. kind of converted your doctor and, you know, and the fact that he's looking at this for some of his other patients is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And even like the um, local news over here done a story on me about being on the oils and the chronic pain and elective surgery. Mm. So, yeah, it's just gone everywhere. That's fantastic. Did you find you needed to adjust your doses much and, and, you know, go through a kind of titration period? Yeah, well, first off, when I got on the CBD, I had to wean off all my medication, my tablets, which that wasn't a fun process. Mm -hmm. The body didn't like it. And then with the oil, I just had to um, just work out what dosage was best for me like just play around with it a little bit, which I done. And yeah, with the um, CBD of a night, I take a mill of it now and then two, five in the morning. Yeah. Okay. So when are you scheduled to have your surgery, Brent? I've got to go back and see the surgeon on the 15th. Um, Cause there was a bit of a muck around last time I went down there. The, um, discs had bulged worse. One had bulged from the side now, so they've got to go in through the side. So fingers crossed, I've got to see the director of neurosurgery and hopefully he has a surgery date for me. Because yeah, I've been off work for, uh, this year will be two years in August. And yeah, it's just from wear and tear, not even a workplace injury. Mm -hmm. Oh, good luck with that, Brent. Uh, thank you so much for your time and coming on to have a chat to me. No, that's fine. Thank you. And we'll, we'll see you in the panel a bit later on. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Bye. Bye. CBD is apparently available over the counter now, but is it really? Here's Paul Maver to tell us more. Hey, everyone. I'm Paul Maver, one of the pharmacists at Health House. And today I want to clear up some confusion surrounding over-the-counter CBD in Australia, which has been widely reported in the media. On February 1st of this year, some new legislation came into uh, effect, allowing cannabidiol or CBD-containing products to be sold over-the-counter from Australian pharmacies. A lot of people were disappointed they couldn't access them, and I'm going to be explaining today why. Now, there were a few conditions to this legislation, uh, which included... Uh, the CBD must be more than 98% of the total cannabinoid content. Uh, the medication must be in maximum daily doses of 150 milligrams and to be sold in quantities of no more than a 30-day pack. And also the products uh, to be sold only to those above the age of 18 years or adults. Now, the last one, which is causing all the confusion, the products must be listed on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods or ARTG. Uh, now, to fulfill this last condition takes time. The, the drug manufacturer needs to carry out a series of clinical trials to show their CBD product is safe and that it actually works. And this may take up to a year or more and involves a mountain of paperwork. And this massive uh, documentation or dossier, as it's known, is then submitted to the Therapeutic Goods Administration or the TGA. And that may take, take up to a year for them to assess. And this process is also incredibly expensive, so not all manufacturers will go through this and jump over this hurdle. Uh, with this in mind, I think it's unlikely you're going to see any CBD products in Australian pharmacies sold over the counter until late 2022 at the very earliest. And that is my best guess. In the meantime, all these products are available on prescription only in Australia uh, under the special access scheme. And um, in most states, a GP can prescribe and it is a one page online form and a relatively simple process. If you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out below my contact details or please add me on social media. Thank you very much. Medical Cannabis Research Australia is a registered Australian not-for-profit charity dedicated to helping patients. We do not receive any government funding. So we do gratefully accept donations. 
If you visit mygivingcircle.org, you'll be able to find us on there, and we would happily take anything that you can spare. Our panel will now answer your questions. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask those questions. I'll, um, I'll ask all of our panelists to actually turn on their video now if they possibly could. Uh, we've got around about a thousand webinar viewers at the moment. So uh, hello to everybody who's out there. Thank you so much. It's an international audience as well. So not just Australia. Uh, I'd like to say hello to the Philippines because <laughs> we know we've got people over there viewing as well. Uh, now, uh, for all of our panelists, um, if I could also ask you, uh, if you do want to answer one of the questions, to actually hit the hand up button so that we can keep this as organized as we possibly can. Uh, just in the meantime, I'm going to pop a quick poll up as well. Um, if anybody would like to, uh, to vote on this, uh, we just wanted to see uh, what sort of um, feeling that people had towards medical cannabis and whether or not it would influence the way that they would potentially vote for political parties. And once we've uh, let this run for about a minute or so, uh, we'll actually show everybody the results so that you can uh, all see it and you can all be a part of it. Now, uh, just for our panelists, um, if you do have your mics on mute at the moment, that's fantastic. Um, don't forget to unmute them when we uh, actually answer the questions as well. So hello to Charlene, to Barb, to Paul, to Gull, uh, to Frank, and uh, hopefully we've also got um, uh, the two boys there as well, who, uh, who both are, are being treated by medical cannabis at the moment. All right. Now, uh, did anybody want to go first? Has anybody got a, a particular question that was raised in the Q&A uh, that they would like to actually uh, talk about before we uh, actually start going through the list in particular? Uh, anybody got their hand up? Um, I can't see anybody in particular. Oh, I, might, I might jump in, if that's all right. Let's have a look with Paul. Okay, go for it, Paul. So a question lots of people asked was pricing. And at the moment, medical cannabis remains a prior prescription vote light. A lot of things, pricing is coming down over time. It's, it's certainly about a third of what it was when it was first introduced around about 2017. Um, the average medical cannabis patient spends around about $200 um, per month on medical cannabis. It does vary. Some patients use more, some use less. The good news, as Barb said earlier on, that it is starting to be subsidised by private health funds. Uh, there's some patients that are veterans that can access subsidies as uh, also workers' comp and motor vehicle. Uh, so that's good news. CBD going over the counters is going to take a while, but it's also going to uh, drive prices down a lot further. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, look, it is expensive. And, uh, you know, as someone that actually is a, a prescribed patient for medical cannabis, um, it is one of my concerns that it does cost uh, a lot of money compared to the other medications that I was on, which were on the PBS. Um, maybe somebody can answer the question in regards to whether or not we're going to see this medication on the PBS anytime soon. Happy, um, happy to answer that one, Jason. I think um, a lot of companies are working towards that, um, but it's also important to understand the process to, to actually register a drug. So that involves um, not only time, um, it usually would take, I mean, typical would take probably around five years to bring a drug to market um, and that's fairly quick, um, but also a lot of money. So um, in terms of the average drug to bring it to market would be hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, which, which cannabis companies individually um, don't necessarily have at their fingertips. So it's just important for people to be aware of that. So Little Green Pharma does have a strategy to, to bring a product to market, but it's a long-term strategy, not a short-term one. Um, so there are products um, registered um, on the Australian Register for Therapeutic Goods. Um, so there's one for multiple sclerosis. There's another one for epilepsy. Um, but neither of those, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, are, are um, available on the PBS. I know Epidiolex um, applied for PBS subsidy, but again, that's very difficult. You know, of all the drugs that are registered with the ARTG, not very, I mean, there are a lot that are, are subsidized, but not all of them. So that, does that effectively Bob, mean that this is a rich people's medicine? And, and what are families that have kids with epilepsy that need particularly high dosages? Yeah, look, I mean, the good thing is costs are, are coming down. I mean, when you look at where things were when we first launched in our first product in 2018, I mean, we were, there were, I mean, most of the products were double or triple the price where we came in at. Um, I think like anything, um, the patients that do benefit find a way. So it is typically about a cup of coffee a day. 
Um, there, there are studies that are, that are subsidizing the medications. Um, there are also, you know, companies like ours that have compassionate access programs, um, things like that. So, so typically I think for the patients that do benefit, um, just, just do find the funds. So, so $5 a day, a cup of coffee. I know some people don't have a cup of coffee a day, but typically if you break it down that way, um, most people end up being able to afford it. Okay, uh, a question for Charlene then. Uh, Ravani asks, are there interactions with many other medications and what about the impacts on the liver? Um, I think this is probably a better question for Paul, being the pharmacist. Uh, but um, yes, I can say yes. But Paul, you're much more qualified to answer than I am. Um, well, firstly, medical cannabis is, is really well tolerated. Most of the concerns come from THC causing drowsiness and for some patients, they you know they can't afford to be made drowsy, um, but this this is overcome by giving the patients low doses of THC, starting low, going slow, as the doctor um, referred to earlier on. But also um, just monitoring it very very closely. For these patients, um, the side effects are, the side effects are very few. The inter interactions um, are minor compared to some drugs, but. Um, like anything, everything has interactions and you need to consider the individual patient's case before the doctor decides it's right for them. Okay, uh, I might put this question to Dr. Frank. Um, uh, Claudia has asked whether or not she has any fellow EDS people here tonight. Uh, apparently Claudia's tried various types of oils but didn't find it to be very helpful with her pain at all. Um, she suggests that it could be because the source might not be good. Uh, and that she might be a strange case because uh, she's got a high drug tolerance and a high pain tolerance. Uh, she describes it as a double-edged sword, but is EDS something that is normally something that could be treated by medical cannabis? Um, that's, that's a good question. I think, I think everyone's different, um, and, and I try not to, to get across, categorise, I suppose, um, patient groups, to, you know, dependent on their, their primary source of their pain. Um, I've got quite a few EDS patients and some, some respond really well, some need higher doses. But I think, um, like, like my, you know, I was sort of stressing in my talk, it's, it's really um, polymodal, you know, pain management. So I, I, I still believe strongly like medicinal, you know, medicinal cannabis has a role, um, but, you know, it's not the only source of, you know, treatment. So um, there, there's a lot of other factors, and especially if someone's got a high tolerance you know, that's, um, you know, I would hope that she's seeing a pain physician at least and we, you know, can we'll try and work out what's the best sort of management. So a lot of my patients not only do use medicinal cannabis, they use other medications, they you know, use ketamine as well, regular ketamine infusions and so, as such. So it's not a one size fits all for all, for all patients and for all diseases that, that cause pain. Is, is it safe enough for patients to continue their existing medication and use medical cannabis? Um, I think so. I think, um, like, you know, um, like, like Paul said, I think the whole thing is really um, to, to watch out for interactions and, you know, really start at a low dose and slowly titrate up. Um, I mean, I've had patients that have been on warfarin, you know, for example, when the cannabis has definitely affected the, um, you know, the, the, the beneficial effects of the warfarin. So we've had to monitor their, their blood clotting as such. So, I think um, you really have to, um, you, most of my patients use a combination of things um, and not just purely solely the cannabis, but you know, one of the, the main benefits is, you know, as I said in my talk, is I think that um, we can actually wean people off the opioids or wean it down considerably. So the, there's a few patients that are taking both cannabis and opioids and it's just really um, being careful more like, you know, the sedatory effects with the THC. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Gull, uh, toxic effects of S8 meds. I mean, I'm not a medical expert, so I'm not really sure what the question's asking, but I, I suspect you do. Well, not specifically. There were, there were lots of S8 meds. I, I would imagine that they're probably referring to, to opioids, um, which would be the most commonly prescribed and used S8 meds. Um, I, you know, they're, they're like anything, the poison of anything really is the dose. Um, opioids can be extremely helpful and they can be really bad. Um, cannabis as well. So really it's, it, I, I, you know, any question there needs to be expanded on. Perhaps there's something else. I, well, I actually wanted to, to sort of follow up on what Frank was saying. I think that 
there might be a tendency for us because we're talking about medical cannabis and some people come to it perhaps naively thinking, okay, I've got terrible problems. I've used everything that all doctors and anyone else can throw at me. I'm still suffering. You know, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. I go to medical cannabis hoping that that'll fix everything. And sometimes it makes a huge difference. You know, in, in my clinical experience, it's, it's made a huge difference. And, the, you know, the, the patients here who've spoken about their experience have said that. But also sometimes it doesn't, you know, you can be underwhelmed by the response. Uh, it's important to recognize, you know, when we have expectations, we're more likely to be disappointed, mm. um, especially if we're starting low and going slow. And we have to be really um, as objective as possible about what it is we're looking for and open to other possibilities. But I, I think specifically, if we deal with cannabis as it's another therapeutic tool, albeit it's not a single therapeutic tool because every product of cannabis is a different tool in itself. But alongside everything else, as Frank mentioned, you know, you don't throw everything away and just go, oh, cannabis will fix it. You add cannabis in, in whatever form, whatever product product is appropriate, you, you titrate it to effect and tolerance and see what else happens. You look for negatives. Um, there is potential interaction as there is with everything. Um, cannabis is no different to that. And you just need to watch. Yeah, um, I do think that we need to point out to everyone that it's it's not a panacea. Uh, although that said, um, I have multiple sclerosis, so I was prescribed cannabis, medical cannabis for that. But the indication with multiple sclerosis is that it's primarily for your cramps and your spasms. And yet for me, it had so much more of a benefit, um, like uh, both Brent and uh, Stephen have said, it allowed them allowed me to come off a lot of my existing medications, but it had a much more uh, broad effect on on me and that it took a lot away a lot of my other symptoms as well i don't look at it as a cure by any means but it certainly helped me with my symptoms and all of my different symptoms uh dr frank if i can just ask you the next question uh does cbd have to be taken every day to be effective or does it start working fast enough uh, that it can only be used when the pain is worse so for example with endometriosis which is cyclical um <laughs> that's that's a good question. I I think um, I I don't think the the you know uh, onset of effect is is um, that that quick um, to you know just use it as as required per se. I I mean we we we're, we're doing a few um, we're looking at you know the inhaled product in you know for patients for acute acute pain and in chronic pelvic pain, which is very similar to the the endometriosis uh, story, which I think has a quicker onset of effect. I think um, just with, with my patient pool, with, with the CBD only, I find that the more consistent analgesic effect is when they take it regularly as opposed to, to as required. Um, so I'm, I'm not too sure, um, you know, I've only been prescribing for about 12 months now. Okay. Well, more just, you know, for, for short term. Sorry, I jumped in there. <laughs> um, Paul, as a, a pharmacist, um, Judy's got a question that you might be able to answer. Uh, Judy has elderly parents with chronic pain and multiple comorbidities requiring medication. Judy's wondering about contraindications between medical cannabis and the usual medications prescribed to the elderly in particular, uh, such as things like cardiac problems, hypertension, diabetes, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, there's a couple of things we keep seeing time and time again, because cannabis tends to relax the patients. It's um, had some, a lot of anecdotal use for anxiety. Patients' blood pressure seems to come down. So uh, as pharmacists, more and more often, we're having to get involved and reduce patients' blood pressure medication and speak to the doctor. Uh, also, it's opioid sparing in a lot of cases, it seems to be. Uh, there's a lot of evidence mounting in that area. So patients on a lot of the opioids find they don't need them as much anymore. Um, uh, as well as some, sometimes their insomnia medication. So it's good to look at the entire medication profile uh, of every single patient, uh, but yeah, typically the patient will start off taking everything and it, it gets reassessed regularly by their prescriber and their pharmacist. Okay. Stephen, a quick question for you. Uh, since you moved across onto the product that also contains THC, which is the, the psychoactive component of it, have you found yourself feeling high or being unable to actually do your normal daily routine? Uh, no. Uh, the product that I'm on is not uh, 
it's not an, not really an indica, so it's not it doesn't really knock me out uh, as such. Um, I'm actually quite happy with it. I can function normally. Uh, I only use it really when I do have a migraine, uh, and it really helps just dull the pain and helps me relax and get the rest that I need to recover um, and, and get back to it the next day. Uh, it's not real not really side effects um, from that perspective um, at all. So Marina did ask a question. She was asking if CBD alone can help with chronic pain. But for you, you noticed that you did need the addition of the THC for it to be as effective as it is currently being. Yeah, so def definitely for the migraine um, aspect. Uh, the CBD helps, I think, for, for, for myself personally anyway, uh, like general anxiety and, and general well-being. Uh, and, and it probably helps keep migraines at bay. But as with life, you know, you get stressed and everything like that. Nothing is a miracle cure, as you said before. Um, you know, uh, you got to take life as a holistic sort of thing. Um, medicinal cannabis is just one part of the, the puzzle, so to speak. Yeah. And I think uh, the THC component just really helps relax at nighttime um, for sleep, gets you a more restful sleep. Um, and puts you into that sort of um, you know restful state, uh, and also when a migraine actually happens, then then it's a really really beneficial at THC that does its job. Brent, in your particular position, uh, I expect that you not only have chronic pain, but you also experience some acute pain as well. Um, Henry has asked the question. Uh, he currently takes CBD full spectrum twenty percent and finds it quite good but says it doesn't get past the peak pain, but it does make life a little bit more livable. Is that your experience? Yeah, with the CBD, I first found out that during the day that it controls the pain, but it's a little bit worse at night. That's why I'm on the THC at night. And I've just um, been prescribed the flower to vape just to get me through the breakthrough pain if I'm having a real bad day. Right. And does it stop you from being able to perform, to, to do your normal daily activities? No, not really, because, yeah, I just take the THC at night. So, yeah, it just helps me sleep because, yeah, I couldn't sleep at night. I was in that much pain. I had uh, a body pillow to put between my legs to help me sleep in that. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, the CBD, like nothing there, just controls it. Yeah, right, Okay. Now, a very important question, and I know we cover this quite a lot, and it's a question that gets asked regularly, uh, and that's in regards to driving. Now, if you've taken either CBD or THC or any other derivative of cannabis, Brent, do you think you should be driving? No, <laughs> especially with the THC. You cannot drive on it. Okay. Now, number one, because it does put you under the influence um, but even if it was CBD, and I'll throw this one across to Paul, even with CBD in your system, even though it's not psycho psychoactive, and even though uh, you would be straighter than somebody that's taken a cup of Panadol, uh, it's still illegal to do so. Not with CBD. No, you're allowed to drive with CBD. Okay. Yeah, the only test, roadside test for THC. Um, and this is this whole kettle, you know, this whole... Um, it's a major problem because there's patients that are taking trace amounts of THC that have been not allowed to drive. And in Australia, uh, as probably the same with most countries, we rely on our cars to get, get places. And there's a lot of elderly patients uh, who need to drive their car, but they've been made to sign documents to say they, they shouldn't drive. But the general rule... They might be on Tramadol or, or Panadol. Yeah, that's pretty but scary stuff. It, it's not... Uh, it's not about impairment, it's about detaching, detecting THC when your system, which lasts for up to two months in fat cells. And is it definitely only the THC? For example, if I was in a car accident and I had a urine test or a blood test and there was no THC, but there were detectable levels of CBD, am I still good to go? Yep. Yeah. They only detect um, THC in roadside tests. Okay. I'm CBD, psychoactive. All right. Uh, another question, I guess, for, for our doctors. Uh, let's go to Dr. Gould. Is it safe for people with heart disease? Uh, as a general rule, yes. Um, as Frank said, um, you know, any patient, I, I, I'm not exactly sure where that whole general term of 
cardiac disease as a contraindication for cannabis came from. Um, we have to assess each patient as they present. And um, the, what, what we're prescribing for them needs to fit their whole clinical picture. So if there's something that is potentially risky for them, possibly because of interactions, or because it may exacerbate an underlying condition, that's when we may stop. But in my experience in reading, I don't see any significant contraindications for the prescription of cannabis in cardiac disease, but I welcome any comments from anyone else on that. Sure. And I guess like anything, um, speak to your own doctor about that just to make sure that it's actually safe and appropriate for you. Now, here's a very quick question that I feel comfortable answering, even though I'm not a medical professional. I like to call myself a medical unprofessional. Um, it's Danielle. She's uh, got MS, just like me. And apparently Danielle is currently using a CBD isolate. So it doesn't have any of the THC in there. Her symptoms are pain, spasms and spasticity. And she's asking if she'd benefit from an entourage blend rather than just the isolate. Now, just in my own personal experience, and I'm only speaking for me, um, I did drop back onto a CBD only product for a, a little while, but I found all my symptoms started returning and quite rapidly as well. The moment I went back onto a 50-50 THC and CBD formula, uh, they all started going away again and I was back to my usual self. So again, talk to your doctor, but my experience was that I needed to have that entourage effect for it to have all of the various benefits that I've been receiving. Did anybody else want to say anything in regards to that? Oh, right. Yeah, I'll say something. Um, I know myself personally, uh, you know, I've tried CBD isolate products and didn't really feel like it did that much. Uh, and just, uh, I know this is this is for uh, humans, this, this webinar, but I know for my dog personally, uh, he, he has epilepsy and he takes CBD um, oil and the isolate product didn't really do much at all for his epilepsy, but full spectrum product works brilliantly. So that's interesting, isn't it? That we're talking about full spectrum products as opposed to isolates or substances that have some kind of synthetic cannabinoids in them. So there may be there's something to be said about that. We'll, we'll have more web webinars coming up and we'll talk about that as well. I think we've got time to take two more questions. Uh, so let's just have a look here. Uh, Sam Spade is asking, is CBD plus THC useful for chronic pain in restless legs sufferers? Dr. Frank. I, I, I mean, the, I th I'm a great believer that the combined product is much better. Um, and I think they, they're both, um, you know, act synergistically. So um, restless legs is one of, you know, I probably um, don't, don't see as much in, in my practices. It's more dealt, um, I, I suppose, by, uh, you know, probably not the best text fit for restless legs. Um, but, but, you know, um, I, I would imagine that, that, you know, the combined product would, would probably be, you know, more efficacious if it's you know, used for pain and restless legs. Or, but if it's painful restless legs, when we're thinking of a neuropathic element too, then certainly that would um, be much more beneficial. Okay. All right. Well, our last question of the evening uh, is for Bob. Now, Bob Alistair is asking the question, how can I find CBD slash THC, medicinal cannabis, that's grown outside, under sunlight and in the soil to harness and activate the ionic energy because I don't want CBD or THC that's grown hydroponically under artificial lights because as far as Alistair is concerned, full spectrum natural sunlight is where it's at. Bob. Oh, Bob, is on mute maybe? <laughs> No, Bob's still on mute. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Hello. <laughs> um, it's a really good question. Look, if you're after a flower product um, and one that's grown outside, you're going to find a lot of difficulty because the TGO, the TGA has instituted what's called TGO 93, which is one of the most difficult, um, I guess, regulations around medicinal cannabis globally. Uh, so they're looking for things like pesticides, um, you know, molds, bacteria, those sorts of things that are really hard to keep in check. In your, if you're growing outdoor. So um, that's difficult, to be honest, um, if you're looking for flour. If you're looking for oil products, um, then that's typically there's, I mean, the majority of the products on the market are imported from overseas. Um, they're bringing in resins um, and, and finished goods from overseas. 
There is an inquiry in the, um, that the TGA is doing at the moment into products being brought in because they don't have the same GMP requirements that we do as Australian producers. So that potentially could change. But yeah, any product grown overseas um, that's an oil should be probably, it's more than likely grown, grown outdoors because it's much more cost effective. No worries. All right. Thank you, Barb. Thank you to everybody. Thank you for, to all of you for, for donating your time, because as I said at the beginning of this webinar, everybody here is a volunteer and has donated their time. So thank you very much for your expertise, your patience and your generosity. Now, before I let you all disappear, I'm just going to show you the results of the poll that we took. Now, the question was, would a political party who has a policy of easing access and subsidising the cost of medical cannabis influence the way you vote? making it clear that MCRA has no affiliation with any political party. Now, we had 82% of the people at this seminar say that it could influence the way they vote. For our, uh, our panellists here, does that surprise you at all? No. <laughs> nope. You're preaching to the converted here, Jace. <laughs> captive audience. Yeah, absolutely, captive audience. Thank you, everybody, for voting in that. Um, look, I'm sorry if we didn't get around to answering your questions. Um, what we can do uh, is if you do email us, info at mcra.org.au, uh, we can pass the questions through to the relevant people to answer them for you. Um, we did have hundreds of questions. We tried to answer the most popular ones. I hope we uh, accomplished something for you here tonight and that you've learned something. To all of our panellists, thank you very much. If I could encourage you now to turn off your video and your audio, so that we don't get a, uh, a look into your private lives. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you and everybody else as well who has joined us. Now, don't disappear because we are just going to pop back to our slides. Um, and we Watch for our upcoming webinars on other conditions that medicinal cannabis may well be beneficial for. From the entire MCRA team, thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon.